The Spirit of God is upon me. Jesus later quotes this. The Spirit of God is upon the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of wisdom. And they say, well, this is, there's seven of them mentioned. Uh, but I went back once and I said, the way you can make eight out of them. So I'm not too clear on that, but it, it could be a reference to the sevenfold Spirit of God. But look at Revelation chapter 8 and verse 2. And it says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. So they could be uh, the seven spirits before the throne of God. Uh, so it could be the seven angels there. In fact, if you look at Luke 119, they could be uh, Luke 119. It says, And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. So the seven angels that stand before the presence of God, it appears that Gabriel is one of them. Now Michael is the only angel called the archangel. At the same time, he might be one of the seven angels that stand before God because the seven angels that stand before God are given the seven trumpets to blow. And we know that Mike, he says the archangel will blow the last trumpet, so that might be Mar Michael. But then again, maybe Gabriel's an archangel too, maybe there's seven of them. Michael the archangel could mean Michael the only archangel, or it could mean the archangel, the only archangel named Michael. So, uh, so there are seven angels who stand before God's throne. They could be the seven spirits. At the same time, it doesn't seem to make much sense for me to say, grace and peace to you from God the Father, seven angels who stand before His throne, and... Uh, and God the Son. And you you, you uh, interpret the drawings as personomorphically and saying that there's not an actual positional piece of this? Uh, I, I would say, yeah, anthropomorphically means that you're kind of giving, you're talking about God as if He's got a body in, in more human terms, human like terms, so we get a better understanding. The throne speaks to God's authority. At the same time, with Jesus Christ, you know, almost all these visions that John sees is, is very, very symbolic. Uh, at the same time, there's a literal meaning. If this communication is going to take place, there's got to be a literal meaning behind that symbolism, the symbolism. And uh, so I would say that uh, I would take it from more times than not to be a symbolic, uh, reference to the, the sovereignty of God. God is in control. Because God the Father doesn't have a body. Now, Jimmy Swagger may disagree. Jimmy Swagger said, well, look at this verse says God's got an arm. This verse says God's got a hand. And then you can point to verses in Psalms, uh, Psalm 90 or 91, talks about God having feathers. So, uh, and wings and stuff. So, uh, I, 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 think we, I think we need to recognize that there are some very symbolic passages. But the seven spirits before the throne are very tough uh, enough to crack. Verses 5 to 8 says the greeting is also from Jesus Christ. Verse 5 is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, uh, the firstborn from the dead. Now it goes into the verse 8, it goes into the description of Jesus Christ here. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. Okay, let's take a look at this. The context here is Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, the name Iesus in the Greek, uh, is from the Hebrew name uh, Yeshua, uh, which we call Joshua. Well, we pronounce it Joshua, and it means the Lord is salvation. That's Jesus' name. So he was walking around with the name the Lord is salvation. Very common. Hebrew name, but this was the fulfillment of it, walking in the flesh. Uh, but Christ is from the Greek Christos, which uh, 
also actually there's also a Greek word Messias which comes from the Hebrew word I believe it's something along the lines of uh, Meshach or something along those lines but it, it, the, the, the Hebrew word for Messiah the anointed one the predicted one from the Old Testament who would come and rescue the nation of Israel and he's anointed of God set apart by God uh, for that purpose so it means Jesus the Jewish Messiah he's referred to as the faithful uh, witness because he spoke the truth he gave us God's truth without any error and he is faithful his obedient earthly life uh, he was obedient to the Father and faithfully told us what the Father wanted him to say he is the first born of the dead he was not the first to rise from the dead but he was the first to rise from the dead and receive his resurrection body in other words when Lazarus rose from the dead when he raised Lazarus from the dead Lazarus died again later on he uh, it's, kind of, it's a resurrection from the dead it's more like a resuscitation he still, you know, if he stopped eating food after Jesus raised him from the dead, he would have starved to death. But when Jesus was risen from the dead, his resurrection from the dead, it was the same body to hold in his hands and his feet, the pierced side, the same body. So don't let the don't Jehovah's Witnesses throw you for a loop there or a Murray Harris at a Trinity Evangelical Divinity School who guys have been slamming and the only other guys have been coming to Murray Harris is defense. Murray Harris has denied that Jesus bodily rose from the dead, or rose from the dead in the same body that he's crucified in. Yeah, they make a big turmoil in the evangelical theological fight. And I admit, when uh, when guys who disagree with you, it, it kind of brings back memories from the Pillar of Ahan, but at the same time, <laughs> if, if you can't get nasty about defending essential teachings of the Christian faith, um, then uh, you know, I, I just don't understand that at all. Uh, I mean, guys was in the right there. But uh, Christ is the first one to rise from the dead with his resurrection body, meaning that he will never die again. He, he rose. It, his resurrection body is the same body, but it had new powers so that you don't have to... You eat food for pleasure, but you don't have to eat food to stay alive. You can travel apparently at the speed of thought. He wants to be in the upper room. He's in the upper room. He wants to be in Galilee. He's in Galilee. Um, so he's the firstborn of the dead. He's referred to as the ruler of the kings of the earth. Well, right now he reigns over the universe from heaven, but Satan is still, Paul still refers to Satan as the god of this age, the god of this world, the cosmos in, in the Greek. Uh, but the day is going to come when Jesus is going to return and reign, bring the kingdom of God two words. Revelation 11.15 mentions that. And so the thousand year reign of Christ on earth will be the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's referred to as the one who loved us. He loved us because he you know, proved it by dying for us. It says that he released us from our sins by his blood. 1 Peter 2.24 1 Peter 3.18 talk about the fact that Jesus Christ bore in his body our sins on, on the cross and died on the cross for our sins he the just one died for the unjust so that we would be made alive now, 2 Corinthians 5 21 tells us that God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him so he released us or redeemed us from our sins by his blood uh, it says that Christ has made us to be a kingdom of priests and we are no longer priests both the Mormons and the Roman Catholics need to understand that we are no longer uh, priests in the form of the Old Testament shadows offering sacrifices or uh, going through rituals we are priests in the New Testament sense uh, by the way Peter talks about this too I, I don't have the exact passage in, in my notes but we are priests in the sense, a twofold sense. Number one, we offer, we do offer sacrifices to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2, though, tells us that it's no longer dead animal sacrifices, but now it's live human sacrifices. We offer our bodies, not under the bodies of animals. We offer our bodies as a living, not a dead sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. In other words, you say, Lord, take my body and use my body, use every ounce of energy that I have, every ounce of strength that I have 
is so that I can serve you. I want my whole entire life to be a, sac a living sacrifice for you. So we offer living sacrifices to God. And uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, we intercede for the lost. So a priest, now a prophet, a prophet represents God to man. He proclaims the word of God, the, the word of God to man. A priest, though, represents man to God. He offers sacrifices to God on behalf of men, and he intercedes for men to God. And uh, so this, in this sense, we are priests. We are a kingdom of priests. Uh, but you don't have to be a preacher to be a priest. It's not like the Catholic Church or the Mormons where you have to attain to a priesthood. Uh, all believers are a kingdom, are part of the kingdom of priests. And we do this by offering our bodies as living, living sacrifice to God and interceding for the lost. It says, To Christ be the glory and the dominion forever. Uh, again, Revelation 11.15 says that the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And then there are loud voices in heaven which say that the kingdom of the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Jesus Christ will receive dominion forever. Uh, in fact, uh, Domini, Anno Domini means Anno Annual, the, the year of Domini, our Lord. Uh, so in Latin, uh, dominion the, uh, is all tied up with the word for Lord, the, 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 the sovereign one who reigns forever. So to Christ be the glory and the dominion uh, forever. Uh, it, it states in Revelation 1-7 he's going to return to earth. The second coming of Christ, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 10 tells him the last days there will be mockers. We'll say, where's the sign of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues to go on in just the natural way. There's no miracles occurring. Doesn't seem like Christ is going to come back. He came. He was here 2,000 years ago. He's not going to come back. And Paul warns us that hey, these guys forget that God shook the earth once in the flood. He's going to shake it again with the second coming of Christ. Uh, the Lord's not slow about His promise. For the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. And uh, but we're, we're, we appear to be living in that time where men are mocking and. Uh, denying that Christ is going to return. So it says that he's going to return to earth with the clouds. Matthew 24, verses 29 to 21. Uh, very clear to tell us that Christ is going to return amidst the clouds in all his power and glory with all his angels. Uh, Revelation 1, 7, uh, Revelation 19 is going to talk about that too. He's going to be sit seated on a white stallion and uh, all his... Uh, Angels and the saints are going to be riding white stallions behind him. Uh, but it says, all shall see him. Every eye shall see him. Jehovah's Witnesses need to look at this verse. I mean, they've got Jesus returning in what, I believe, was 1914 invisibly to Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Christ's second coming is not going to be invisible. Yeah, yeah. In, 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 their, in, in fact, that's how he speaks through their the Watchtower organization. Either 1914 or 1870 something. They've got so many prophecies that they, I, uh, that they totally baffled me. Uh, but uh, but he's going to return to the cloud. Every eye shall see him, even those who pierce him. That's a reference uh, to the Jews. Uh, although the Gentiles also played the role, and you know it was our sins that put Christ on the cross. Uh, even though it was the Jews who twisted the arm of Pilate to get him there, the Jewish religious leaders, the early church, the, the Jesus, the, the worship of Jew, Jesus Christ, the apostles were Jewish, uh, the early church was Jewish, uh, but uh, those who feared them became a phrase uh, to describe the, uh, the Jewish religious leaders who rejected him. But it says that all the nations will mourn over him. Why? Because in rebellion against them, they've accepted the mark of the beast, and when he comes back, he's not only coming back to rescue the church, but he's also coming back to judge the living uh, and the dead. Uh, Christ here is referred to in verse 8 as God. The Alpha and the Omega, that's the first and the last letters uh, of the Greek alphabet. 
that's the omega in the capital form, that's the omega in the small letter form, and uh, that's the alpha in the capital form and the alpha in the small form. It's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet, and so it's just, uh, just a way to say that, that Christ is the first letter. Now this context is talking about Jesus for three verses, and then, and then all the things says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And it's the same thing I said about God the Father earlier, but it's the context the man that Jesus is speaking. The old wisdom will say, no, no, it's just the context just breaks off, and verse 8 is talking about the, uh, that's good, yeah, he's got that, it's right, even here on this cover, and that cover a while, the book has got the Alpha, and the Omega, the Alpha and the Omega, right on the cover. Uh, but uh, but Christ is the Lord God. Isaiah 9, 6 refers to Jesus as the mighty God. Uh, unto us the Son is given, unto us the shadow will be born, the darkness will be upon his shoulder, the things will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Everlasting Father that should have been translated and basically the eternal one who is the cause of everything else that exists. Uh, because it's not the uh, it's the Hebrew word for father that means more the the origin of something, like right? the father of uh like well, we say Soren Kierkegaard is the father of modern existentialism. He was the one who founded that group of thought, he didn't give birth to all the existentialists that are out there. Uh, or John Dewey, the father of modern education, he was the one who originated the uh, present day philosophy of education for the public school, which has left us with a bunch of uh, idiots who are going to be reigning over us in the next generation. Well, he was basically, it was his way to, it was his way to bring uh, socialism in this country, take it over peacefully uh, to, to move us towards a socialist state. He figured the best way to educate kids would be to, to, by the time you get a high school diploma, you can hold down a good job, you know, wood shop, metal shop, auto mechanics. You can hold down a good job and you can barely read and write so that uh, you would be easily manipulated by the socialistic elite, which is, you know, that's, you know, a lot of people go, oh, you know, don't, don't talk that kind of talk, but hey, that's what Bill and Hillary are all about. Um, they believe that, you know, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a big question about money with taxes and all. What it is, is the more, the more of your money that the government has, if the government spends your money for you, rather than you spending it yourself, it's an issue of freedom and an issue of control. Uh, the more control the government takes over your life, what the, what the government is basically telling us, the liberals in the government, is you are too dumb to know what's best for you. We will do your thinking for you. And this all comes out of, uh, out of John Dewey uh, and that type of thought. But Christ is the Lord God. Christ is eternal. Uh, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, the Word became flesh. So, so Christ is the Lord God, He is eternal, He is the Almighty God. Um, let me see, I got it down another passage here, let me see if this is... Uh, yeah, Christ, Christ again in Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13, let's take a look at that. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Obviously, that's Christ. That's not God the Father. And then he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So, it's real clear. Jesus refers himself as the Alpha and the Omega. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses won't give you that. They'll say, no, the context broke off, and that's God the Father jumping in. So... Jesus is speaking and talking about Jesus and all of a sudden God the Father just pops into the picture. Uh, but we'll see a little bit further, hopefully in this lecture, we'll see a little bit further when we get down to uh, verse uh, 17 and 18 that Jesus refers to himself as the first and the last, which is the same as saying he's the Alpha and the Omega, 
Isaiah 44, 6, God calls himself the first and the last. There's only one first and the last. That's, that's God. Jesus refers to himself as the first and the last. There's no escape of all his witnesses because he refers to himself as that one time being dead. And contrary to Friedrich Nietzsche and his philosophy, God the Father was never dead. Only God the Son, when he became a man, died on the cross for our sins. So let's see again that Jesus Christ very clearly is claiming to be God. Uh, the purpose of this book is mentioned in verses 9 to 20. Uh, and so we'll take a look at that now. Look at verse 9. John gives us his location. He's on the island, the island of Patmos. Um, take a look at verse 9. I, John, your brother, and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was on the island of Patmos. It's a small island about 10 miles long and about 6 miles wide. Okay? It's off the southwest coast of modern Turkey. Uh, behind the island is the island of Samos. So that will really help you. Uh, but so it's right, it's not really far it's just southwest off the coast of modern Turkey, and modern Turkey is where the seven uh, uh, churches are that he's going to be talking to. But John was exiled there for preaching the gospel. Irenaeus, an early church father, mentioned that. Clement of Alexandria mentioned it. And Eusebius in his church history quotes from them mentioning it. So we have good reason to believe this is the Apostle John, who early church history reported that John was there until the reign of Domitian and to end it when uh, Emperor Domitian died in 96 AD. But he was exiled there for preaching the gospel. That's what he means. That he's on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Because he preached God's word, because he testified about Jesus, that's why he was exiled to this island. He kicked off the Emperor Domitian who wanted to be worshipped. He had to say... Uh, that uh, Caesar is Koryas, Caesar is Lord, and the Christians refused and said Jesus is Lord, and uh, so John was exiled there for preaching the gospel. He identified himself as, uh, in verse 9, as your brother. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 12, verses 46 to 50 said, Everyone who does his will is his brother and his sister and you know we're basically a, a new family a spiritual family of believers he says he's a fellow partaker in Christ meaning that he shares in the following tribulation and the sufferings and the trials even the leaders of the church fact they were the biggest targets the leaders of the early church the apostles especially were the biggest targets for persecution he shares in tribulation God didn't promise us a rose garden he promised us eternal joy in his presence uh, but during this life there's going to be persecution and tribulation if we manage to escape it we're either not doing our job or uh, we just lucked out and we're the exception rather than the rule but the rule is that Christians will be persecuted uh, America a like big religion that we've experienced is the exception rather than the rule uh, fellow partaker in, in, in Christ because he shares in tribulation but he also shares in the kingdom God serves. In the kingdom there is only one king and everybody else is servants. Well Jesus is the king and we're servants and John is a fellow partaker serving God as we should as well. Uh, and uh, fellow partaker in perseverance which is the endurance that comes from trusting Christ through sufferings and trials. John state uh, he was in the spirit. Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. So he says he was in the Spirit. Uh, he was in the Spirit. You could say that you're in the Spirit could mean being filled with the Holy Spirit. Like Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, I do not get drunk with wine, and this, is, this is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, all believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it means He's in full control of you. Uh, the illustration I get is if you're driving a car and the Holy Spirit's in the passenger side seat, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 
But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're in the past and you're seeing the He's right. Okay? Uh, but I think John means something more than just being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? There's uh, passages like in the, uh, Acts 4, I think, verse 31, that the apostles, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to proclaim God's truth with uh, boldness. But I think something more is being implied here. And the Spirit also implies being in a state where God reveals supernatural information to one of his servants. And this spirit also implies being in a state where God reveals supernatural information to one of his servants. The closest illustration I can see for this today, you know, it wouldn't happen in this wooden, artificial way, but it's the channeling that goes on today where demons that dwell people and speak through them. It's kind of, they enter into a state where they're supposedly receiving messages from the spiritual realm. It's kind of like that John is in a, in a state where God is communicating to him, giving him a vision. And no, he's not just, God's not dictating through him. Uh, he's receiving information from God, information that, that, that has no errors, uh, infallible information, pure truth from God. And then he gives us this information. Uh, so being in the Spirit implies being in a state where God reveals supernatural information to one of his servants. He says it's on the Lord's day. Uh, by this time, by 95 and 96 AD, the Lord's day already became Sunday. The Sabbath, the Jews had gathered on Saturdays. Seventh day Adventists will tell us that we were breaking. One of the Ten Commandments that you worship on Sunday was supposed to still worship on Saturday. The, when the Jews gathered, rested, the day of rest was Saturday. That was to celebrate God resting from His creation work. But when Christians worship on Sunday, the devout Jews, the apostles, they changed it to Sunday because Christ rose on Sunday Almost all the resurrect, post-resurrection appearances, possibly even all of them, were on Sundays. And so the, these devout Jews, the apostles, ended up changing the day for Christians to gather to Sunday uh, in celebration not of God's creation work, but His recreation work or His resurrection work and uh, His work of salvation. God was doing a new thing. So Sunday was the Lord's Day, the day that Christians met Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, basically when you gather on the, on the first day of the week, gather together your, the donations, the tithes, the offerings, the donations. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 mentions, mentions that same type of thing as well. It was already by 95, 96 AD, the Lord's Day was the common word for the eighth day or the first day of the week, uh, Sunday, the day of the week uh, that Jesus had risen on became the day that Christians would gather. Uh, John hears a loud trumpet-like uh, voice. Now, later on in Revelation 4 1, there's a lot of guys, I think Wallace speaks against it, you know, he's a priest river. Uh, there's the sound of the trumpet speaking to John, says, come up here, come up into heaven, I want to show you something that's going to take place. A lot of priest rivers will say, yeah, that proves that the trumpet John is being raptured into heaven before the tribulation starts in Revelation chapter 6. And John represents the church. I think Walvin is one of the clear-headed pre-tribbers, unlike people like Al Lindsay, who's got a lot of good stuff to say, but believe me, he can, he can take any verse in the Bible and turn it into a verse that proves the pre-trib rapture. I mean, that's, you know, he's seeing it everywhere, and uh, he needs to calm down a little bit. But I think Walvin, if I remember right, admits that Revelation 4.1 is not a verse that teaches the preacher of rapture. I'll we'll have to look it up and check it out and I will watch if I have read that textbook. Uh, but he hears a loud trumpet-like voice. It's just, it just amplifying the fact that there's the power in his voice that he hears. What John heard is in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 1 saying, Write in a book what you see. 
Well, we, we were reading that product right now. Write the book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. The seven churches in the uh, area with now modern Turkey, uh, the Asia Minor area. Uh, and so he's told to write down what he now sees, send it to the seven churches, uh, the, the churches that we mentioned over and over again. What John saw is recorded here in verses 12 to 16. Look at verses 12 to 16. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstand, one like a son of man. You refer, reference that to Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, as a reference to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. I saw uh, in the middle of the lampstand one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his breast with a golden girdle and his head and his hair were white like white wool and like snow and his eyes were like a flame of fire his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the, the sun shining in his strength. What John saw, he turns to see who's the, the one who spoke to him, and he sees seven golden lampstands. A uh, little later on in this passage, verse 20, it tells us the very last phrase, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So they are symbolic of the seven churches that John is going to be writing to. So the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now Matthew 5.14 Christ is talking to his followers and he says, you are the light of the world. Now John 8.12 and another passage, Jesus refers to himself as the light of the world. But he puts his light in us to shine through us so that we testify to Jesus. The, the uh, common uh, phrase that goes around uh, the saying that sometimes you're the only Jesus some people will ever see. We are the light in the midst of the darkness to, to spread the light of Christ to others. So the church is uh, the light of Christ. These seven churches, by the way, in, in some sense it, it, it applies to, it's symbolic for the entire church. These seven churches, seven is the, the, the number of uh, God's number of completion, uh, the universal number, the, and so these seven churches are symbolic of the entire church. We're going to see that if these churches messed up, God will remove their lampstand. If a church denies the true faith, if a church turns its back on Jesus Christ, its witness will be removed from the community. They might stay in existence. We have a lot of churches in our area that stay, have stayed in existence. You know, 50, 60, 70 years after Christ removed the lampstand. Uh, and praise God, our church is proclaiming the gospel truth. This church right here, Southern Way Baptist Church, they are preaching God's truth. There's lots of good churches in our area that are doing it, but there's also lots of dead churches, and that's real unfortunate. Jack, you were talking about a church where the, the pastor uh, doesn't preach from the Bible, he preaches from paganistic works and New Age type material. And he spends all his time getting his people to pretty much try to have an experience with a rainbow rather than with Jesus. And so the guy got picked off with Jeff told him, said, well, you ought to just take the cross down from your church and put a rainbow up there. And the guy got all upset with that. But it is true. Why not? If you're not going to preach the cross and you're going to preach a rainbow, then put a rainbow up there. Uh, but, uh, but you, you might have a rainbow, but you don't have your lampstand. Uh, the seven golden lampstands symbolize the seven churches. By the way, in the tabernacle, the portable temple, and then the, the temple that was built later on, the stationary temple in Jerusalem, you had the seven branched lampstand in the temple. And so this the symbolism there uh, seems to be related. But John turns and sees that in the midst of a lampstand, one like the Son of Man. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, one like the Son of Man, that exact same phrase is given of, of Jesus Christ in the second coming of Christ. Okay? So this is a reference to Christ, the Jewish Messiah. Mark 10, 45, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Uh, 
But the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is standing in the midst of the seven lampstands. Jesus Christ is in the center of these seven churches and of every local church. Jesus Christ is in the center of the universal church. Jesus Christ uh, is in the center of the church. So He is in our midst. Uh, what our church is doing is not being done behind closed doors. The all-seeing eyes of God, of Christ, are on us. He's in the midst of the lampstands. If we are obedient to Him, we have access to His power. It says that He has a long robe with a golden girdle. Uh, this has the reference to the, the, high, the Jewish high priest. Uh, or that same type of thing. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, Jesus Christ is referred to as our great high priest. Uh, so Jesus Christ here is wearing, you've got the, the tabernacle type setting with the seven golden lampstands representing the churches. Christ is in the midst of the churches, in the midst of the lamp, lampstands, and he's dressed as the high priest. Uh, by the way, you can't get a good solid understanding of Revelation except through a good solid understanding of the Old Testament symbolism. Uh, so, hopefully, if you're if you're having if you're not a real old, a, expert in the Old Testament, hopefully the guy who's teaching the course in Revelation or the textbook that you use, and hopefully those guys are experts in the Old Testament. Using Scripture to interpret Scripture is the way you figure out Revelation, the areas that can be figured out. Uh, but if you get a teacher like David Koresh, who doesn't know his Bible, doesn't know the Old Testament, then he's shooting off the hip the whole way, and lo and behold, the land was slain, and it turns out to be himself. Uh, and so, not to be led astray, that allows Scripture to interpret Scripture. It says that his hair is like white, like snow. Snow, uh, snow in the Scripture, the whiteness speaks of complete purity. Uh, also, having the white hair speaks of old age, or well, speaks of, of, of Christ as being eternal. In Daniel, the book of Daniel, the Father is, God the Father is said to have white hair. The symbolism there. Again, don't get into the Jimmy Swagger thing and you're giving God the Father a body. Only God, the second person of the Trinity, became a man and, and took on a body. Uh, eyes like a flame of fire. Fire throughout the scriptures is symbolic of divine judgment of impurity. Our God uh, is a consuming fire, I believe. Uh, in Hebrews 10 or Hebrews 12, uh, he has feet like burnished bronze. Well, the bronze altar was where in, in the temple where you sacrificed the animal sacrifices. It was symbolic of divine judgment of sin. Uh, he has a voice like the sound of many waters. Again, this is, this is reference to the power of God. The seven stars he has in his right hand. Now, the seven stars, according to verse 20, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The word in the Greek, angelos, for angels, for angel in the singular, actually, it literally just means messenger. So the question is, are these seven messengers, are they human messengers? Or are they messengers from out there, which will make them spirit beings, angelic beings? And, uh, I tend to think that they're the preachers or the ones who bring the gospel message uh, to the people. Because it, here Christ gives this message to angels who give it to John, who gives it back to angels of the seven churches. doesn't seem to make much sense. It seems more likely that he's giving it to the leaders of the seven churches. Okay? But that, that's another one that could be either way there. Uh, but he has the seven stars in his right hand. I see that as and say he has the leaders in his right hand. Now, the scriptures, and, and God, if you're in Jesus' hand, John 10, 28, you're there for protection. No one can snatch you out of it. But Hebrews 10, 31 is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. So the leaders of the seven churches, you're in God's hand. If you're doing things his way, if you're trusting in him, you're there for protection. But if you're going to lead people astray, you could also be in his hand for judgment. 
And so it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of living God. And Paul, the word of God, with a sharp two-edged sword, said right in the, the same passage, out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword, Ephesians 6, 17, the word of God is referred to as the sword of the Spirit. God's word is referred to in Hebrews 4, 12 as a two-edged sword, and it says that God's sword penetrates the innermost parts of man to judge and even judge the intentions of the heart. God's sword is a two-edged sword. One side of that sword, it saves, the other side judges. And how God's sword is going to operate in your life is going to depend on whether or not how you respond to God's grace. Revelation 19.15 talks about Christ slaying those with the sword that comes out of his mouth. He slays people with the infallible word of God. It says that his face shines. Christ's face shines like the sun. That speaks of the glory of God. Exodus chapter 34, verses 28 and 29, and verse 33, says, the glory of God. Moses, when he saw God in all his glory, his face shined from God's glory that he had to actually veil his face. Uh, but the glory of God, even in the temple, uh, God's glory, or in the tabernacle, when God's glory was upon it. Uh, but his face shined like the sun, shined with the glory of God, the greatness, the beauty of God. Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus appeared there before the disciples in all his glory and became white as snow. Uh, tremendous brightness that Elijah and Moses appeared along with him. In Acts 9, Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus and converted Paul, not Paul off his horse, and Paul was blinded by the light of Christ. Uh, who John saw, verses 17 and 18, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. So Christ identifies himself as God. John fell at his feet due to Christ's glory. Seeing all that glory was just too much for him. He fell at Christ's feet, but Christ comforted John, and Christ removes the fear from John. He wants us to know that he's in control. Our God is an awesome God. He's a powerful God, but if we trust in him, that power is going to be used to protect us, not to crush us. And John, it's like, it's like when Jesus calmed the storm, Peter looked at him and said, Get away from me, for I am a sinful man. He saw God in Jesus in all his glory, and he, he saw that the light of Jesus was exposing his sin. And John had the same response that Christ comforted John. I saved you, I'm going to protect you, and I want to remove your fear. Uh, Matthew 14, 27 speaks along these same lines. Christ said that he is the first and the last. God refers to the first and the last in Isaiah 44, 6. Uh, so Jesus is referring to himself as God. The Jehovah's Witnesses have no escape here. He refers to himself as the living one. He says he was dead. And Jesus was the only member of the Trinity who died and rose because he's the only member of the Trinity who became a man and got then died on the cross of Calvary. What a bummer.